COVID virus or no COVID virus, my allergies remain the same. I cough and sputter constantly, especially in the mornings. The only good thing that's come out of that is that I already had a stockpile of masks before all this started because I have to wear them when I'm out in the yard a good part of the time or mowing or whatever else. Now Ken said that uh, we would do the best we could what we have to do with. The fact of the matter is that's the way it is every day of our lives. <laughs> we do the best we can with what we have to do with. And we face an enemy every day to be real about living life as a faithful child of God, a Christian. And if we do not understand that from the beginning of our days in the church as babes in Christ, having risen from the watery grave of baptism, new creatures, then we're doomed to failure because life is not a constant thing. I suppose you could define it in a way to say, well, it's constant. It's always up and down. <laughs> and that's just the way it is. Christians have to learn to deal with disappointments. Still remain content and have peace of mind and press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Always the reality that we're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us. Matthew 6.33 We said it many, many times. We'll continue to say it because it's the fact of the matter that we need to know in the study of the scriptures that most of the New Testament is written to members of the church. And most of it, therefore, is to teach us, to exhort us, to admonish us under any and all circumstances and situations to remain faithful to the only thing that is really constant and unchanging in this life, and that is the Word of God. Now, this time last year, even this time in December of last year, we could not foresee what we would deal with through the first six to seven months of this year. Couldn't foresee that at all. But here we are facing the reality of the situation. And there's turmoil that's involved. Now, a question to you. Do you think the devil is going to let this go by and not try to work on your faith in Christ? Since he has a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour, certainly he is not. But it doesn't have to be just something like the COVID virus. Or, coupled with that, which compounds it, the moral turpitude that is sweeping the land and grows daily. The Bible doesn't change, does it? Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my word won't. But Paul knew this, and to the Philippians, who were so dear to him because of their great support of him and his efforts to do the work that God called him to do, in Philippians 3 and verse 18, I want you to listen to these words, Philippians 3, 18. Keep in mind who wrote them. Think about his life and what he suffered for the cause of Christ. And think about the Philippians' relationship with him and their steadfast support of him, not only monetarily, but in their prayers for him, in their desires for them, for him to know from them how they thought about him. So he says in part of this letter, for many walk of whom I've told you often, underscore the word often. Did you mention this, Paul, what he's about to say to the church in Philippi, now and then, sometimes? He said, I've told you often. And now, notice, so he's repeating himself, isn't he? And now tell you even weeping. What does that tell you about what he's about to say? What, the impact it's having upon his inward man because of his dedication to the Lord, his sacrificial service to the Lord. 
knowing nothing but turmoil, as he writes about himself concerning what comes upon the apostles and the ambassadors of the court of heaven to earth, the trials and tribulations that were peculiar to the witnesses of Christ as they did what Christ called them to do. He says, not even, not tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now we know, and we'll refer to it again, and I don't know that a sermon hardly goes by that I don't mention the passage of what Paul said to the church in Rome in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let me say this passing. Notice it's the power of God to save to the believer, which refutes the idea that believing in Christ is all that's necessary. The gospel is the power of God to save the believer. It would be ridiculous to say that the gospel would save somebody who denies the deity of Christ, that he is the Son of God. But that's not enough. Essential? Absolutely necessary? Yes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. John 8 24. Belief is essential. You cannot go to heaven without believing that Christ is the only begotten Son of God. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by him. So when we look at this, Paul is saying to those who heard the gospel, those who believed the gospel, those who repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Christ, were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins, the Lord had added them to the church, their members of the church in Philippi of Macedonia. And yet he says to them what he does, how that he often warned them of those who were their enemies. One of the things that we realize, and I'm going to cover three points here as to the enemies of the cross of Christ, but there are multiplicity particulars under each point that we won't have time to go into. We may mention some of them toward the end of the lesson. But you'll remember that Herod, from the beginning of Christ's life, sought the death of Christ as a babe. You remember his own parents had to leave at the guidance of God through the angel to go down to Egypt until those, as he was told later on, Joseph was, who sought the child's life were dead. So under direction of God, they came back and went up into Nazareth where Jesus grew up. And so we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of all the things that Christ did and all of the enemies that he had culminating in the very ones who should have known him the best, putting him to death by crucifixion. He was constantly at odds with those who should have known him, for they had 1,500 years of instruction for the law of Moses, which was the law that was to bring them to Christ, Galatians 3.24. But he underwent that. He was and is described as a man of sorrows. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. And we need to remember, we don't need to try to find heaven on earth. I think the devil tries to get us to do that so that when we have a situation happening as it is now, or even less than this, that, oh me, we've got to get this way. Are we, when is it ever going to be back this way? Uh, could never be. There have been plenty of times in history where things were one way, but after a year or two, they never got back to where they were. Sometimes it was for good. Other times it was for bad. So we need to understand uh, when you hear people talking about the new normal regarding the situation with the COVID thing, there's been a lot of times in this world there's been new normals. But a Christian, because the word doesn't change, how to live in this life does not change. And the burdens that come upon us because of our faith in Christ does, does not change. In other words, Paul said of the way the devil worked, we are not ignorant of his devices. 
We know how he's going to approach us to get us to violate God's will to sin. We know that. So we find in these books written to Christians all sorts of things about how we are to be able to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw near to you. So the Lord has authored the way from earth to heaven. Paul, when he was Saul, laid waste to the church, persecuting it. Because he believed Jesus was a person who was a false teacher. Yet he would become the one who preached Jesus Christ and him crucified and suffer the same persecution our Lord suffered, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2. So there are those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, who deny the deity of Christ, who deny that he is the only Savior, even if they admit there is a need for a Savior for us, saving us from our sins. And I referred you to Romans 1.16 already. And then we might add to that John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, notice should not perish. Doesn't mean if you believe in him you will not perish. I think that passage is quoted that way by those who teach that uh, salvation is by faith only. But it doesn't say that. They should not perish because they are believers, but the gospel is the power of God to save the believer. So they must learn the whole plan of salvation and understand how they get into Christ and exactly at what point God says your sins are remitted because you've contacted the blood of Christ. We know the word gospel means good news because it's good news about salvation from sin, justification in the eyes of God, reconciliation to God, becoming a child of God, being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, a member of the body of Christ, having the expectation of the resurrection of the dead to eternal life and all things of this natural world is over. So Christ died for us. He was buried. He rose again the third day to die no more because he had never sinned. Death could not hold him. So he went through all of that on your behalf and my behalf. We read in Hebrews 2, 9 that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And again to the Corinthians, Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14 tells us plainly, he died for all. Paul pointed out that the word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us as Christians, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. But let me say again, the power of God to save the gospel, watch this word, is activated by our proper faith in God and Christ, which faith comes by hearing the word of God, which means we've received the evidence contained in the word of God that proves the deity of Christ that is who he claimed to be. Paul wrote, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood, Romans 3, 23 through 25. In other words, Christ died, and he suffered and died, if you want to put it that way. He came into this earth, in fact, for this whole reason, because regarding his death on the cross, he said, to this end was I born. I, I knew what was going to happen when I came. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, burdened down with the reality of what was before him, as a man, he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So he went through the whole ordeal for you and for me. So why should we allow anything in this world, as topsy-turvy as it is, and as much as the devil does what he does, why should we let that draw us away from the constant truth of God's word? It doesn't change. So the enemies of the cross of Christ, one of them, are those who are unbelievers. And they war constantly against 
the church and the gospel, the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the inspiration of the scriptures, the church of our Lord. But there's another that Satan uses, and that is the immoral people. And they may fit, of course, under the other category too as enemies of the cross, because many believers are certainly very immoral, no morals or immoral, breaking the moral code. And in so doing, being immoral, they dishonor the Christ. So the purpose of the cross of Jesus Christ was not simply to free us from the guilt of sin. And I think some brethren miss this. But also to free us from the practice, the practice of sin. Paul deals with that in Romans 6 as he reminded the members of the church in Rome of what they did when they became Christians. At the very point they became Christians. Why did he do that? To make them realize the kind of lives they were to live in the church. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. In the Greek it says, may it never be so. How shall we that are dead to sin, that is separated from the purposeful, habitual life of not caring about what God said, but just simply doing as we please. That's what he means. Because the Christian being converted cares very much about pleasing God. He longs to please God. That new creature in Christ, old sins, having been washed away by the blood of Christ, the waters of baptism, added to the church, the spiritual body of Christ, that person wants above all things not to be guilty of sin. It hurts a Christian to recognize a sin in his life. Well, what's going to make up for all of that? Because we're all fallible people. From time to time, in weakness of the human flesh, we sin. It's a far cry from the person who doesn't care, who lives solely for gratifying the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes of pride of life, who thinks nothing about God, Christ, or the Bible, or living as the Bible directs them. Big difference. You know, even Hitler did some good things. To this day, the Audubon stands as to one of the things he did. And, till just recently, the Volkswagen. <laughs> now, that's, those are good things. You may not think of them as such, but economically and in the area of transportation and so forth, those are good things. But what was he, a good person? No. So even a bad man can do, now and then, a good thing. Well, a person who's got his mind set on God who recognizes I'm a new creature in Christ and I'm to live by the authority of Christ, Colossians 3.17, because of the human being, will from time to time sin, mentally, with the mouth and flesh. But he doesn't intend to. He's working right the opposite. Well, what, what is there about this system of salvation called the gospel system? It's because it takes care of that. The person who walks in the light as Christ is in the light is an vigilant, constant review of one's mind and life and is not desiring to break God's will and is always willing to repent of any sin they see in their lives. Thus God has authored a system that takes care of that person who constantly confesses that fact and when there's a specific sin, confesses that sin having turned from it. Big difference because under a pure law system when you sin you die. There is no recourse. Understand that. But the gospel of Christ, the gospel system, the New Testament system is not just and only a law system. It is a grace system also. It tells us that in Christ we're covered by the blood of Christ. That when we stump our toe from time to time, even though we didn't want to do it, or we did and found out later, well, I shouldn't have done that. And God takes care of that because we constantly have an attitude that says, I do not want to sin. I'm trying to order my life where I don't sin. I'm studying and I'm praying and I'm confessing my sins routinely and regularly. Even the fact that I know I can sin. You say, well, I didn't sin today. You sure? You see, you could have committed a sin of ignorance because that part of the Bible you 
don't understand its application quite well, but you still broke it. What takes care of those things? The mercy of God extended to us through the gospel as members of the church and by the blood of Christ. Thus, the blood keeps on flowing to cleanse us. If you think to go to heaven that you have got to die without any sins having been in your life for, say, at least one day, then you're not going to go to heaven. The older you get, the more you recognize that as you do all within your power to know the truth and live it. So many weaknesses, and so many whatevers. Now what makes up for all that? Christ. Christ makes up for all of it. How? Through the blood of Christ. You remember when the Passover lamb was offered for Israel? And of course they had no way of understanding what that type actually meant except, except as it involved them and that he was going to kill the death of the firstborn of all in Egypt who did not have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and the lintel. But he did say this, typology. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that simply is talking about the death of Christ. Christ is our Passover. And won't it, and isn't it, a wonderful thing in this topsy-turvy world where the devil has the power he does and he always seeks to destroy you. That is your steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. In other words, you are habitually serving God. That's your goal. That's your plan. That's how you've worked it. You're not going to be turned from it. You're faithful, in other words. The blood of Christ, through the mercy of Christ, continually cleanses us from our sin. But there are those, such as he described, Paul did, in Philippians 3.18, as enemies of the cross, he says, whose God is their belly and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. <clears throat> that could have been written this morning about these United States and most of the world. When you see these rioters and all sorts of people out doing what they're doing, you just think of this kind of thing. Whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. They are determined to do their own thing, as the hippies authorized that and published it back in the 60s, do your own thing. It's self-willed. It says, I don't need God. And as some have recently said, uh, we don't, God hasn't delivered us from any of these things. We've done it ourselves concerning the COVID-19 business. But these are enemies of the cross of Christ. They do not recognize Christ or spiritual things. They do not recognize God's existence. They don't recognize the Bible. It's an outdated book. and should be relegated to museums. But Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Matthew 121. Notice we cannot be saved in our sins. We must be saved from those sins. If not, we're lost forever where there is no hope. Again, I refer you back to Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. We touched upon the first part of that chapter. <clears throat> where Paul's still reminding the church at Rome of what they did to become Christians to motivate them to greater service. When he said, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, what's the conclusion? Why do you use that? What does that mean to know I was baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into, into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. What is the conclusion? Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. So what is a new life? What does it mean? Well, he says plainly in verse 6, henceforth we should not serve sin. That is, we're mindful of serving Christ. That's our goal. That's how we've arranged our lives. And this goes back to what I've already said. We habitually and purposely serve Christ by studying his word and doing as his word leads, guides, and directs us. And the Lord makes up the rest. I think we recognize some of that when you're dealing with your little children. Let's just take a child who's just starting to walk. He can take a few steps. But you know how they stagger and barely can get along. 
Do you ever help that child? Because when they start walking, they want to walk. But they just can't make it too well, so you put your hand down and take their hand. Or you do something to steady them and help them keep on walking and getting better at their walk. We sometimes ask the question, has he started walking yet or has she started walking yet? But if you see them when they're walking right after a month that they started, would you consider that kind of walking to be as you walk? No, you wouldn't, but he's walking. And so is a babe in Christ. And the Lord holds our hand in the sense of being patient with us because he knows we're, we're wanting to walk. We desire to walk. We're doing all that we can to walk. And we get better at it, you know, just like a child who's normal grows up and not only gets to where they're toddlers, but they really get up where they can walk. And they will, just the way it works. In 1 Peter 2, 16, Peter said to Christians, as free, free from our past sins, free in Christ, and not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as a servants of God. That really is a parallel to Romans 6, 3, and 4. Somebody got the idea, a false idea back then, that, well, if grace saves us, then the more sin we commit, the greater the grace we receive. Well, Paul destroys that idea. He says it really works right the opposite. Those who really benefited from the grace of God through belief and obedience to the gospel, they strive with all the power they have to learn the truth and live by it, and not compromise the truth in life or word. So Peter echoes Paul, because they're all guided by the same Holy Spirit. They're all writing the last will and testament of Christ. And he says to Christians, don't allow this freedom in Christ to make you think that, well, God's going to just cover everything without any effort on your part. You never find that kind of doctrine in the Bible. God expects us to put forth all that we can. And here's the thing about grace and mercy. He makes up the difference. That's the difference in the law that says a pure law system, if you sin, you die. And the grace that came by Jesus Christ through the law of Christ. Thus we're taught, come ye out from among them, be ye separate. We're taught that we're to perfect holiness in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 through chapter 7, verse 1. So there's this constant effort on our part, yet trusting God through Christ to make up the difference by the blood of Christ as we labor to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, know your labor is not in vain, pointless or worthless. Where? In the Lord. But those who are immoral in the church are out of the church are enemies of the cross of Christ. And the third one, denominations are enemies of the cross of Christ. I suppose that my brethren in of the last 50 years have really fallen victim to the idea that the pious unimmersed, those who do not believe in the one church as it's set out on the pages of the New Testament, Oh, they acknowledge God and they acknowledge Christ as Savior and they acknowledge the Bible as the Word of God. But they really don't believe you have to obey the gospel to be saved and being baptized into Christ. But, oh, they're so good. They're so fine. They do anything for you. They're there to help. Maybe they even are more that way than some members of the church, even though members of the church should be exemplary in that. But that doesn't make any difference. The Lord gives us a picture of the judgment. And there are going to be people there who are lost as they can be. He said, Lord, did we not do thus and so? And there were good things, they said. Did we not do thus and so in thy name? Do many marvelous works in thy name. You know, Christ just doesn't argue with them. He didn't say, yeah, but let me show you where you messed up. He just says, depart from me that work iniquity. But they were doing good things. How do they work iniquity? Ye that work iniquity, the everlasting fire is prepared for the devil's angels because they didn't act by the authority of the New Testament of Christ. It's that simple. It's that simple. 
that's the reason having the authority of Christ for what we believe in practice is highly significant. And there is no authority for denominations. They split up believers. In John 17, 20 and 21, you're very familiar with it, as Christ is praying on the night before his death, after he had prayed for the apostles, he prayed, neither pray I for these alone, the apostles, but for all of them that believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us. Why? That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. For anybody to say, oh, it's good to have these denominations. You go to your church, I go to mine, we all get to heaven together. And members of the Lord's church say, oh, isn't that so wonderful? These folks are such fine folks. If you don't abide by the doctrine of Christ, you're not fine folks with God. And moral conduct is great. But morality alone won't save anybody. It just won't. You have to accept Christ on his terms as presented in the word of God in order to be saved. And people who reject the plan of salvation are rejecting Christ. That's what I think a lot of people just will not think of, even members of the church. To reject the gospel, any component part of it, is to reject Christ. So we've got people who say, well, everything's all right. We believe in Christ. You go to your church, I'll go to mine. We all get to heaven together. Doesn't make any difference what a person believes, just so they are sincere. That's not taught in the Bible. That's not according to the will of heaven. And we go to heaven when we comply with the will of heaven. Some would even be happy they just overlook denominationalism. And they think that, well, denominationalism, as we've known it for several hundred years, wasn't back there at all in the first century when the New Testament was being revealed and written down. But it was. Not like it is today, but it was. And it was condemned, if nothing else, by the prayer of Jesus. But you had it addressed in very early seed form by Paul to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1.10. Plainly, let there be no divisions among you. I've said many times, let has the force of a commandment. You're responsible as members of the church not to allow these divisions to come. Now he's talking about division over what is necessary, what is essential, what is obligatory to become a Christian and live the Christian life in the church. Paul and Barnabas had a big difference over whether to take John Mark or not take John Mark. And they could work together, but it had nothing to do with violation of obligatory matter. It was a matter of option. They still went on out and did the work of the Lord. In fact, two missionary journeys came out of their, dis their differences. So we're not talking about differences and how a thing ought to be done or the best way it ought to be done or who we can work with. I always consider it to be a great thing that God has that in the Bible because it tells us that some of the greatest men that will ever serve God can't work together. But they don't go about trying to backstab one another later and gossip and backbite one another all over the place. There's no indication of that between Paul and Barnabas. None whatsoever. They just went on doing what they could do the best they could with what they had to do with. But some people don't see it. But nevertheless, the question was asked, is Christ divided? Getting people to see, you're not to divide up to have this church and that church and different organizations and ways of worship, different ways of being saved. That's denominationalism. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. And we need to understand what the true church is, how it's pictured on the Bible, because that's the way we're going to be judged in that day. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. We cannot accept a baptism that does not do that. We cannot accept a baptism that's not a burial in water. We cannot accept a baptism that doesn't follow believing in Christ, repenting of one's sins, and confessing one's faith in Christ, thus qualifying one to be baptized. One must know he's being baptized in order to obtain the remission of one's sins. These things and others are there. Now, I said these are three general areas, yet there are a multiplicity of things in each one of them. And members of the church can have some of these things in various forms in their lives. 
that's the reason that each one of us must be honest in the application of such sermons as this or when we're studying our Bible and the prophecy of our homes, that we can see these things and do something about it in our lives because ultimately you and I are the only ones that can make the difference in our lives in service to God. Honesty of heart must be there as we study the Bible, learning how to write and divide it and apply it, and to understand who really is my enemy. You might say, well, really it comes down to this. I'm my own worst enemy. Well, that's true because I must yield to whatever Satan throws at me through the appetites of the flesh to get me to violate God's will. I've, I must not be ignorant of Satan's devices. And when I know them, I must do what's necessary in resisting them. As Paul said in Ephesians 6, I must put on the whole armor of God. So we have enemies. Things happen in this world that Satan can use to disrupt your life and cause you to forget your service to God. Your lack of faith in God, what proper faith is, who really is a Christian. We must not let that happen. If you are not a child of God, we urge you to obey the gospel as we study this morning. If, as a child of God, Satan has found access into your life to cause you, by your yielding to him, to sin against God, we urge you to repent of that, come confessing it, and we'll pray with you and for you. That's the thing to do. That's the way to deal with the enemy. So if you're subject to the Lord's call, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.